Saudi Arabia and Israel have intensified discussions over normalization of ties. What are the implications of this move? September 28th is International Safe Abortion Day. But why are so many women denied this essential health service? And a recent report has chronicled instances of hate speech gatherings in India. What does it say about this dangerous trend? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The normalization of ties between Saudi Arabia and Israel, if it happens, will be one of the most momentous developments in the region. Now, the United States is definitely trying very hard to get this to happen, even though the Saudis have placed some very tough conditions. One of the key issues is the question of Palestine. Now, the official Saudi position remains that a Palestinian state is a prerequisite for normalization. But that seems highly unlikely with this current Israeli government under Benjamin Netanyahu. So what exactly is on the cards? Are the already besieged and attacked Palestinian people at further risk? We go to Abdul. Abdul, thanks for joining us. Now, this issue has been in the news for many, many months now. We have been hearing about back-channel talks going on for a long, long time. Uh, recently, Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi Crown Prince, even gave an interview on this, which was really uh, made a lot of news as well. But now we have the Saudi delegation visiting Palestine. Uh, so we're seeing some actual concrete steps. I believe an Israeli minister also traveled to Riyadh, if I'm not mistaken. But so could you maybe take us through, you know, what exactly is this normalization process we're talking about and what are the demands from various sides? Well, uh, the normalization process uh, is a larger US-led process, basically, uh, between, the Isra between Israel and Arab countries. Uh, as we all know, Arab countries decided uh, long back in early 2000, uh, during the summit, Arab summit, that they will not uh, normalize their relationship with Israel until a Palestinian, independent Palestinian state is created with East Jerusalem as its capital. And on that condition, of course, Israel has not fulfilled that condition. And that's why none of the Arab countries, except for the Egypt, which signed a normalization deal long back in 1979, and Jordan, uh, which basically followed Oslo Peace Accords and normalized relationship with Israel. Apart from these two Arab countries, none of the other Arab countries had any uh, formal ties with Israel. And, and that basically, of course, uh, uh, pays, ha has a heavy price to pay as a, Israel is a country, its legitimacy and so on and so forth. And that's why uh, it's a big deal for Israel. And uh, US being, it's, uh, it seems, the guardian of its foreign policy has basically taken a responsibility on its shoulders and in, under Trump administration, they started Abraham Accord, uh, uh, this, this basically in which they offered certain uh, benefits to Arab countries in return of them re uh, normalizing relations with Israel. So, of, of course, some of the closest US allies like Bahrain, um, UAE, um, and uh, the countries which were on the uh, neither here nor there because of the changes in the politics and so forth. So for example, Sudan, Morocco, uh, they kind of went ahead and normalized, signed this uh, so-called Abraham Accords. Uh, Saudi Arabia is, given the fact that it's a, one of the biggest and, uh, countries in the Arab world, the most, uh, r r the richest and the most powerful uh, in many senses, uh, is a regional player. Its normalizing relationship with Israel, of course, has much more uh, significance than uh, any other country which have done so, so far. Uh, so uh, Israel is desperately uh, uh, wanting to do it. And that's why uh, the uh, US is basically ready to uh, fulfill whatever uh, Israel, uh, Saudis are demanding in return. Uh, there is, it is not a, a secret that there is a relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, not officially, of course, uh, but uh, to make it official, uh, which has a larger uh, diplomatic, political and other implications, uh, has uh, uh, benefits. And that's why uh, there is a push. And, and there, as you said, there are visits going on. Uh, Saudi ministers uh, are visiting Palestine. 
uh, uh, Israeli ministers are basically visiting Saudi Arabia. So the uh, U.S. delegates are there uh, basically trying to figure it out how to do it. There, there are two major demands which Saudi Arabia has put for in so far what we have what we are hearing is of course the, the support for the domestic nuclear uh, program uh, and uh, of course uh, other uh, benefits uh, in terms of the funds in terms of uh, larger uh, uh, economic uh, uh, benefits and so on and so forth until these th two things uh, are fulfilled um, Saudi Arabia is saying they will not normalize but but that is also not very clear. So uh, we have to still wait and watch. But Abdul, in this context, the key question, of course, is of the Palestinians, because uh, what we're seeing, of course, is Saudi Arabia is making, uh, you know, making some statements about how the issue is to be resolved. On the other hand, we do see an Israeli government under Benjamin Netanyahu that has actually escalated anti-Palestinian actions over the past, uh, since it came to power, even governments before have been following that path. We know that the two-state solution is pretty much dead at this point. So, where exactly is the ground for, uh, you know, a kind of deal or a compromise here, considering that uh, it looks unlikely that Israel will change its path and the Saudi demand, on the other hand, is in another direction? Exactly. Uh, so, in that context, one should look. If you see the reports coming uh, from Saudi delegation, delegations visit uh, to Palestine and the Palestinian Authority uh, putting some conditions apparently uh, that if you want to normalize uh, relations with Israel, it seems that Palestinian Authority has also given it up that they know that they will do it somehow. So they want to take something out of it and therefore they are putting some condition because it's a matter of political legitimacy also. Saudi Arabia being the champion of uh, quote unquote Arab world, Arab politics, and so on and so forth, a very long time, uh, it will be uh, difficult to uh, justify normalizing relations. And therefore, they want some legitimate way out. And Palestinian authorities think that if they put pressure on uh, Israel, they might uh, convince Israel to do certain things. So, for example, they have demanded that um, Area C, which was uh, uh, during the Oslo Accords, was given to uh, the majority of the uh, occupied West Bank given to Israel under Israeli security and political control should be uh, partially, at least uh, civilian uh, administration should be transferred to Palestinian Authority and there should be a time bound uh, final status negotiation. So uh, apart from that, of course, there are original demand of uh, Saudi Arabia opening a consulate uh, in uh, Jerusalem. So if these demands are fulfilled, we will be okay if we normalize a relationship. That's what the reports say. Uh, though Saudi Arabia has uh, still has still reiterated its commitment to this two-state solution and to the Arab peace proposal and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it seems uh, at this moment uh, it's very uh, very uh, difficult to say in which direction it is going. And of course, uh, when it comes to Israeli state, as I, I rightly pointed out, they, they do, not, do not need to do any of these things uh, because uh, they are changing the status of Area C would be that the fate of the illegal settlements and around 700,000 uh, illegal settlers living in those areas and occupied East Jerusalem uh, will be uh, in a difficult situation. And no Israeli government at this moment can take that risk, given the fact that it is run by mostly uh, by the settler, uh, illegal settler leadership, like Ben Guir and uh, Smotrich and others. Thank you, Abdul, so much for that analysis. Again, something we need to really keep a watch on for the next weeks and months because it will uh, probably be quite a defining moment. Thank you so much. September 28th is International Safe Abortion Day and women's organizations across the world are expected to hold actions and events. The right to safe abortion should be uncontroversial ideally, but it has been under attack in many countries and in some places there has even been a backsliding. We go to Anna of People's Health Movement to understand why this is happening. 
Anna, thank you so much for joining us. A very important day to uh, commemorate, especially in the light of developments in various parts of the world. In fact, we'll go to some of these regions uh, in later questions. But to begin with, maybe could you talk about the significance of the day itself, a bit of context or a bit of history as to why it's important? Well, essentially, today uh, we mark International Safe Abortion Day. Uh, and essentially what the day is meant to do is to draw attention uh, to the fact that abortion is healthcare and that it should be provided safely and freely uh, to all women and to all of those who uh, who need it in any part of the world. Uh, but, you know, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the day also marks the fact that uh, for years and for decades, uh, countries... Uh, have failed to um, to step up to this uh, to this obligation, and have essentially moved uh, in a very different direction uh, in uh, in many in many cases. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know we've seen international organizations, including the World Health Organization, advocating for safe safe abortion as essential part to uh, of uh, healthcare, uh, and of course an essential component of sexual and reproductive healthcare. So uh, today, uh, it's actually a call to action. We'll see feminist movements, we'll see health movements all around the world uh, rallying behind the, the demand to decriminalize abortion where it uh, already uh, isn't decriminalized, uh, but also uh, expanding abortion services in many ways, including by providing um, uh, abortion, through, uh, abortion through pills, so uh, using medicaments, uh, but also to um, to adding those pills to the national uh, to the national list of essential medicines, which should uh, should increase access. Uh, and of course, you know uh, what uh, the health movements and what the feminist movements are also asking uh, asking governments to do is to stop repressing activists who are fighting for for women's rights, uh, as unfortunately is the case in many countries still. Right, Anna. Of course, in this context, uh, you know you would think that this is one of those issues or cases where there is gradual progress in various parts of the world over time. And in fact, in many countries, we have seen that state after state, region after region, country after country, legalizing abortion after uh, massive struggles in many cases by uh, women's organizations. But unfortunately, we've also seen, uh, you know, uh, instead of progress, we have seen things moving in back, backwards, so to speak, in a very regressive direction. The classic example is also that of the United States where, uh, you know, protections were removed uh, some time ago. And another case, I guess, is also Poland, which is important to talk about because we have elections coming up there very soon. So could you maybe talk a bit about that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you bring up very important, very important examples, you know, uh, when the changes to abortion, uh, to abortion legislation were made in the United States, uh, we were also observing, uh, so sort of in parallel, uh, in a way in parallel, uh, very different changes occurring in Latin America. Uh, and this is also something that needs to be highlighted that essentially Mexico very recently uh, managed to decriminalize nationally abortion in the country. Uh, but on the other hand, as you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, Poland is seeing a very different si situation. So all the way since 2020, women in Poland, but also healthcare workers in Poland have been persecuted uh, for providing or seeking abortion. Uh, it, Although they might be providing abortion on a, on a, on a legal basis, so that's something that uh, human human rights organizations have been pointing out uh, very recently. And so, essentially, what we're seeing in Poland is that first, uh, it has a very restricted um, restricted space where you can actually get abortion legally. Uh, in 2020, they removed the, um, the possibility of being granted an abortion based on uh, the fetus being ill, uh, terminally ill. So, uh, and uh, on the basis of this ground, around 90% of abortions in Poland were being granted at the time. So you can imagine this, the, scope, uh, the scope that uh, this decision uh, has, uh, has affected. And now uh, we're seeing and we're hearing reports from the ground, uh, very disturbing reports, that uh, women and health workers, their families, their friends, they're being investigated by the police, by the judiciary, uh, in a very aggressive way, uh, uh, in an attempt to, uh, to instill fear 
and to essentially make them not to provide abortion or not to seek abortion even if they know they need it. So uh, this uh, covers uh, a range of groups. The women from the age of 17 to the age of 40 have been affected by that and health workers are uh, growing increasingly, uh, inc increasingly fearful of what is to come. Right, Anna, and finally, very briefly, if you can maybe take us to what are some of the kind of actions expected in various parts of the world on the occasion of International Safe Abortion Day? Well, I think it's fair to say that we'll see a whole range of actions. And uh, I think that as the day progresses and as we hear reports also from Latin America and from uh, from the Western Hemisphere, uh, it will become more colorful. But uh, what uh, we know is going to happen is that there are going to be demonstrations. For example, in France, we're going to see various protests in different cities. Uh, people are also taking online action. So if you follow uh, social media today, I'm sure that you will find a lot of uh, a lot of materials focusing on on safe uh, on on access to safe abortion. Uh, and there have already been some reports about uh, analysis focusing on Latin America, but also focusing on access to, to abortion uh, in Eastern Europe. For example, there has been a very recent and nice report about access to abortion in Croatia. Uh, so uh, essentially uh, what the day is supposed to do is to inst uh, instill solidarity and to inspire people to work together uh, in order to ensure that uh, abortion is finally uh, adopted as an essential part of healthcare and can be provided through public, publicly fund funded health systems. Thank you so much, Anna, Anna, for that analysis as well as for giving an understanding of how the situation is in various countries, especially Poland. I think we'll be tracking more news from there in the coming days as well. Thank you so much. And finally, a report by the research group Hindutva Watch says that 255 anti-Muslim hate speech gatherings and events were recorded in India in the first six months of this year. That is in 181 days. A majority of these incidents took place in states ruled by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party. The report also noted that the ruling BJP has benefited from rioting based on religious polarization. And Hindu extremist groups are responsible for these hate speech gatherings. We go to Pragya Singh for more details. Pragya, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, quite an important report because it kind of, I think, uh, tries to chronicle or give a larger picture of what is happening in the country. A lot of, uh, you know, smaller incidents may, of course, not have been chronicled. But could you maybe first give us a brief summary of what really this report says when it talks about hate speech gatherings? What does it mean? And, you know, what's kind of the impact? Right, uh, Prashant, it is an important report simply because now in India we are getting habituated to, uh, you know, information about what's happening in our country, which is important, which is relevant, coming from outside the country. Someone else is doing the job that the Indian media is supposed to do and others in India are supposed to do, but are not able to because the government is simply, uh, the government at the center, the Hindu nationalist BJP, which is ruling the country and several states, has strongly discouraged any approach towards you know what is its ideological proclivity to challenge that and that's exactly what the report really does find it it finds that there have been 255 recorded instances of hate speech the definition which it picks up is actually what the united nations would regard as hate speech targeting any ethnicity uh, etc now the focus of this report however is on anti-muslim hate speech which has been a sort of article of faith uh, since the BJP came to power in 2014. That's what the report says. It says there has been a 500% jump in, uh, you know, instances of hate speech, including instances which have led to actual violence. The, uh, the amazing part of the report is that 68% of these hate speeches were actually referring to uh, what the Hindutva Watch has categorized as a conspiracy theory. So in a sense, no surprises there because the kind of uh, the, the way they have weaponized certain terms, which are cultural terms like or religious terms like jihad, water jihad, fertilizer jihad. Now, fertilizer jihad in, in a sense means that, you know, the right wing Hindu nationalists, they say that in India, the Muslim farmers are overusing fertilizer. And that is a form of jihad because fertilizer can be dangerous to your health. You see, I mean, it just, uh, it's not, I mean, a conspiracy theory would not even sum up the extent to which this is damaging because fertilizer overuse is a genuine issue in India and the government successively have tried to tackle this. It has health implications. It has no religious implications 
logically it goes on and on like that and the other crucial conclusion is that the uh, election coming up in 2024 the national election and the election in various provinces this year in 2023 do seem to lead the um, bjp leaders including some of the top leaders the elected leaders to make more and more hate speeches 80 percent of the hate speeches they have documented are in bjp ruled states in fact you you might think that they're happening in bjp ruled states but those who are making them are part of the opposition uh, you know uh, parties but that does not seem to be accurate either because uh, in states where the uh, Bharati Janta Party, the BJP has lost and another party has come to power, the hate speeches drop uh, in, in frequency, tremendous drop in frequency from, in fact, 96% of the hate speeches recorded in the southern state of Karnataka were actually done during the term of the previous BJP government. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's a very worrying trend simply because it rests on conspiracy, conspiracy theories which are notoriously hard to challenge and yet it also seems that it's spread like wildfire the 500 percent increase that i just mentioned right Pragya. also this has the impact of this is really dangerous because of course like you said a large number of these uh, uh, events or hate speech gatherings have calls of fall violence another large number also have calls for boycotts so there's also a kind of uh, you know, even even if it does not immediately lead to a riot, there is a kind of stigmatization. There is a kind of uh, breaking of the social fragment, uh, social you know uh, fabric that takes place because of these kind of repeated uh, hate speech gatherings as well. Yes, Prashant. You know that actually also there is. I think if I remember correctly, there's 33 percent of the instances of hate speech referred to. Uh, quote unquote, the need for inflicting violence on Muslims, and a smaller percentage, six or seven percent, actually refer to specific arms, the need to specifically take up arms against Muslims. So, therefore, we can conclude, based on what Hindutva Watch has recorded, that this is not mere bigotry which can exist anywhere. This is this is actually, uh, you know, and we have instances in India where such violence has been unleashed. At, at the conclusion of such cataclysmic events, whether at a small scale or a large scale, what the BJP and its leaders and the Hindutva groups end up doing is blaming the people or saying that their conspiracy theories are therefore valid. And so it's a circular argument and you know it leads back to itself and so it perpetuates itself, but it's notoriously difficult to uh, control. And uh, I think one of the things that's really relevant is that the 17 states that Hindutva Watch has uh, culled reports uh, based on public sources, actually, uh, it indicates that uh, in the run up to the elections in uh, five crucial states later this year and in the 2024 looks of election, uh, the opposition parties and people in general, civil society need to prepare for these events and find a way to challenge the narratives that the that are being pushed pragya thank you so much for that analysis and that's all we have time for in this episode of daily debrief we'll be back with another episode tomorrow with more stories from around the world until then do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org follow us on all the social media platforms and if you're watching this on youtube please don't forget to hit that subscribe button